You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the first Doctor story, The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Actually, the official name is just The Massacre. The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve was a temp title. Uh, I wanted to actually talk about that as we got as we get started. So okay. put a put a pin in that, folks, because we're going to mm-hmm. talk about that. Uh, but uh, before we do, I wanted to tell you all that uh, we have some more great listener feedback that we want to share with you at the end of the show. So be sure to stick around for that. Uh, we would really appreciate if you would take a moment to write a review of the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Let's you do a like a star rating, that sort of thing, and share the podcast with your friends. Uh, help us grow this community of Doctor Who fans and reach more listeners. And finally, uh, I want to tell you about another show on the StarQuest Network I'm certain you'll enjoy called Pray Station Portable. It's a different kind of podcast where you get to pray with us every day. Uh, in various prayer times for the Liturgy of the Hours, also called the Divine Office. So be sure to check that out wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash PSP. Now, before we talk about the massacre, uh, I wanted to first mention a significant date as the show uh, is released. We've just passed uh, the 10th anniversary of The Secrets of Doctor Who. We've been doing this for 10 years um in the our very first episode was called the pilot appropriately enough i guess uh which was the first episode of the second second or third season of capaldi the 12th Doctor. first season first season of capaldi did we start with the first season of capaldi i guess we did didn't yes. we? Mm-hmm. so it was so it wasn't even the pilot it was the um it was the uh regeneration episode Right. Mm-hmm. No, now I remember. That's right. Right. And it was uh, Father Roderick and mm-hmm. uh, Stephanie and you and Father Corey and me. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, that's how we got our start. And it, we had, in the beginning, we, had, we, we have five yeah. pod, five podcasters at the beginning, and now we're down to just two. So <laughs> we've done the elimination rounds. <laughs> it's down to the final two. Who's going to make it through to the end? <laughs> <laughs> if this were a Highlander podcast, we could say there's, there could be only one. <laughs> uh, so you know, I think we'll both make it to the end. I, mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure I'll be here for that, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to point that out. There are older po- uh, Doctor Who podcasts. There are some that were there at the very beginning in 2005 of the of the reboot i don't think there were any back in 1963 but uh certainly mm. uh there's some that go back to 2005 so uh but we're, we're glad to have been doing this for for so long and uh we're gonna we're gonna see it out we're gonna see the to the to the very end uh all right so let's talk about the massacre and uh before actually, we talk- actually let's talk about what we mean by see it through to the end oh, what okay. we've been what we've been doing is a rewatch of classic who with interspersed new who Mm-hmm. And some interspersed additional stuff like Big Finish for Doctors that we've completed the TV runs of. And the basic plan is we want to finish doing a complete rewatch of the TV run. And then we probably won't shift over to just Big Finish for all of the past Doctors and do Big Finish every week. But we will... Um, come back and do new releases of Doctor Who whenever something new is released. Right. So probably after, and we're still a couple of years away from this, but um, but we probably won't be doing um, it weekly once we complete the rewatch. And we'll probably be, uh, we'll be devoting our efforts to all the other podcasts we're on. <laughs> um, and it could free us up to do some new stuff potentially, but then we will come back and cover new releases of Doctor Who material in televisual form. Right. Right. Uh, my my estimate is sometime like maybe end of 2025, early 2026, somewhere around there w- mm-hmm. w- is when my estimate is will we'll c- complete. But yeah, whenever there's a Christmas special or a new season with four, 15, 16, 17th Doctors, whatever, uh, we'll be back for that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to I get the, this projects I've wanted to do for like so long. Like we w- we've wanted to do a series of Babylon 5 for ages. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to be able to get to that. So, um, yeah, looking forward to to some new things as well all right so uh let's talk about the massacre jimmy can you give us a recap and then we'll talk about some of the stuff surrounding it 
Oh boy, this is a complex one for just four parts. Um, this week, the first doctor and companion Stephen arrive in Paris, France in August of 1570, in 1752, uh, just before the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day. So they're smack dab in the middle of a simmering conflict between French Catholics and French Protestants known as Huguenots. Out of curiosity, the doctor goes to visit the famous apothecary Charles Preslin, and he gets sidelined, apparently, though they don't make this clear, helping Preslin leave Paris to start his to restart his scientific work. Meanwhile, Stephen falls in with a group of Huguenots and gets embroiled in the tension between Catholics and Protestants. It also turns out that a famous visitor to Paris, the Catholic abbot of Amboise, looks exactly like the doctor. And Stephen is convinced that the abbot is really the doctor pretending to be the abbot. Stephen also meets a girl named Anne Chaplet, who brings news of the upcoming massacre. The stage is set for the massacre when an assassination plot is set in motion to kill someone called the Sea Beggar, who is actually the Protestant Admiral de Coligny, a friend of the Catholic King. The assassination plot is the work of the Queen Mother. Stephen tries to stop the assassination, but the admiral is still wounded. The admiral, who uh, the abbot, who was an intermediary in the assassination plot, is then killed as a traitor to the king, and Stephen believes that the doctor is dead. However, the doctor returns, saying he was unavoidably delayed. Based on information from Anne, the doctor then learns the date and that the massacre is about to happen. Without revealing this to Stephen or Anne, the doctor orders Anne to go home. He and Stephen then leave in the TARDIS, and the Queen Mother orders the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre of the Huguenots. Aboard the TARDIS, Stephen learns about the massacre and that all his Huguenot friends died. He also accuses the doctor of being responsible for Anne's death, though they don't actually know that she died. Stephen is outraged and says he's leaving the very next time the TARDIS lands, and he does so, leaving the doctor alone. The doctor muses about his lost companions and considers going back to his own planet, but says he can't. Just then, a young woman named Dodo Chaplet bursts into the TARDIS, thinking it's a real police box so she can report an accident. Stephen also bursts back in and tells the doctor to take off because two policemen are coming to use the TARDIS as a phone box to call their headquarters. The doctor takes off. Stephen is horrified and warns Dodo that she may never get home, but she doesn't care. It also turns out that Dodo's grandfather was a Frenchman named Chaplet, and the doctor and Stephen are heartened that this is evidence that Anne Chaplet survived the massacre and had descendants, including Dodo Chaplet. The end. <laughs> Before we get to our overall impressions, I want to talk a little bit about the behind the scenes, you know, the, the background material uh, uh, stuff, including the title. Uh, so I, I called it the massacre it's of, of St. Bartholomew's Eve. And you mentioned how um, you know, there are many sources to say the title is more accurately just the massacre. Um, and there's some debate over whether you know, because it was uh, I think it would originally aired, it aired as the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve. But it, that's less accurate for some reason, right? Yeah, because the massacre itself really occurred on St. Bartholomew's Day. It may have started on at the, the night before, but it really, when all the casualties happened, it was during St. Bartholomew's Day. Okay. Also, at this point, they didn't have uh, titles for the whole story. It was Each weekly episode had its own title. So, like, the first one is The Massacre or The Massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve or something like that. The second is The Sea Beggar. The third is The Priest of Death. And then, oh, I guess it's the fourth is The Massacre. Right. The first is The um, War of God. The War of God, yeah. Yeah. So they didn't have complete story titles back then. They had individual episode titles. So the title is a bit up for debate in this period of Doctor Who. Yep. Uh, I want to... Just a quick correction. You, you, you said um, it takes place in first you said 1572, then 1752, but actually 1572 was the right. Okay. The right I had year. it. I had it. Had it reversed. <laughs> so um, another hit pure historical. So that's really great. Mm -hmm. um, yep. All, uh, all, although uh, oh, the little bit more behind the scenes. This doesn't exist as a, as any in any really visual form for us anymore. Yeah, this so is how, just did, how, did, how did you consume it? I bought the audiobook of mm -hmm. the uh, but the audiobook of with linking narration of the original audio. There's also mm -hmm. an audiobook of the novelization that's available, but I opted mm -hmm. to go for 
the what's closer to the TV version. And I always prefer to use visual media. So I watched a fan reconstruction based on publicity stills. Unfortunately, this is one of the few episodes in this period they didn't have telesnaps for, but they did have publicity stills. And on Daily Motion, you can find uh, fan reconstructions using the publicity stills, which is what I watched. They also had a fan animated version. But the, I, I prefer seeing the original images, even if they don't move, to see yeah. in bad fan computer animation. <laughs> yeah, this, you know, and just as a reminder to folks who you know, may not be aware that the BBC had a policy of junking uh, its older sh you know shows once they aired they would just throw away the the, the reels well, and no they kept them but then they had a library clearance move where they started throwing them all away yeah and that damaged the uh, the the history of the first and second doctors they're not all preserved some of them are but some and some have been rediscovered but a lot of them were junked mostly yeah. in the second doctor's tenure yeah uh, but this is one of the first Doctor ones that is like the worst hit. Like there's nothing. Some of them had, you know, some episodes, but this had no none of the episodes. So um, so your impression, overall impression of the story? Well, I I think that um, that it starts strong. I had my notes for the first one. That's so refreshing to watch a straightforward historical, not modern nonsense in a mm -hmm. historical setting. Um, and then I think the th the fourth episode was very strong. I think the middle two episodes are weaker. Um, there's a lot of the story is focused on Steven running around. It's hard to keep track. The cast in this is unusually large mm -hmm. and it's hard to keep track of who all these historical figures are and things like that. Um, the politics of the situation are pretty complex. Um, it, it becomes clear by the end what's going on, but there's a lot of now, which, which of these people are Catholic and which are Protestant? It's hard to tell at times. Um, so it's, it, I think the middle two episodes are weaker, but I really liked episodes one and four. Yeah, I, I really like this. I'm on record as saying, I, I love the pure historicals. I wish Dr. Who would do more of them. Um, and this is another one of those pure historicals that I really enjoyed, uh, you know, the, the first Doctor ones have been in France, several of them, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the Reign of Terror and now this one. And both of those, which I've only ex experienced both of them in audio. And I really enjoy it, it as an audio story. I, it, I think mm -hmm. it worked. You're right. At times it was tough to determine who was talking. So I usually would fall, have the um, transcript from the Chakotea.net mm -hmm. website. Uh, they have... Um, all the transcripts of the of Doctor Who episodes up there, and so if I ever got confused, I could look at that and say, "Oh, that's these people." So, so that helps. Um, Peter Purvis did the linking narration, and mm -hmm. he also helped with some of he, that as well. And he he played Stephen in this. Yes. So one of the things the audiobooks tend to do for Lincoln narration is they try to bring back a companion actor to do the Lincoln narration. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting how this was mostly Stephen run, doing, you know, the action. Mm -hmm. We had William Hartnell playing uh, the you know, the, two, the the Abbot and the Doctor, mm -hmm. and the, yeah, and it, but he wasn't in it very much. And this probably, given the you know what we've often talked about, William Hartnell's health was probably giving him a bit of a break in this time period, you know, for for health reasons. Something, uh, I don't know for health reasons, but he certainly didn't have to work as hard. I was struck, and we have a bigger theological issue we need to mention before we really mm -hmm. start getting into it. But um, I was impressed by William Hartnell's performance as the abbot. It is markedly different than his performance as the doctor. And apparently mm -hmm. the director, this is, the I think, the first maybe second, but I think the first episode of Doctor Who that was directed by a woman, um, she pushed William Hartnell to change his mode of acting from the Doctor. At first, she thought the Abbot and the Doctor were too similar, and so she pushed him to act different when he was playing the Abbot, and he did a good job. It, 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 it The Abbot comes across as a markedly different person than the Doctor. He does, and it is ironic, you know, that the one you know episode where he's playing two different characters is the one we don't have video yeah. of, uh, which would would have been so great to, to would have added a lot to see that. Um, yeah, this is also I think the it, it's certainly one of the first, if not the first times that an actor plays more than one role. 
on Doctor Who. I mean, not, I'm not talking about background actors and things, minor characters and stuff, but you want where the main cast plays someone other than who mm -hmm. they originated. So in this, we have the, and, and this sets up the faces problem on Doctor Who, who. Why are there so few faces in the, in the universe? So they keep coming back, you know, right. like the, the, so here we have the first doctor and the Abbott are twins in the second doctor's time. It's going to be the second doctor and Ramon Salamander, the dictator are twins. Mm -hmm. um, the 12th doctor is based on both um, a, a, a guy from Pompeii and a guy from Torchwood. And so we have the, and the 15th doctor, and uh, sorry, the 14th doctor and the 10th doctor are the same. So, and the sixth doctor is the same as the, the commander of the guard. Commander Maxwell, who, yeah. who, yeah, who shot uh, his predecessor, the fifth doctor. Right. So, yeah, uh, you're right. It, it does introduce that. Uh, so and and we apparently, have, the, apparently that was because William Hartnell pushed. He wanted, he, he said he wanted to play an additional part. And so they came up with this twin idea for him. Interesting. But there's no explanation in this for why the Abbot looks like the Doctor. He just does. So we should probably discuss a little bit the history and the theological uh, matters that this story deals with. You know, uh, mm -hmm. France at this time, this is post-Reformation, and the Huguenots were the Protestants uh, mm -hmm. in, in majority Catholic France at the time. Yeah, um, and they they actually now they do invent some characters like the abbot is not a real historical figure, mm -hmm. but they do stick pretty closely to the actual history of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, which is what it's normally called. It's not called the St. Bartholomew's Eve Massacre, um, not usually. And it there was this like assassination attempt on the Admiral de Coligny and 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 there, I think there were some other assassination attempts. It was kind of a rolling start to this. And then you had the massacre itself. And it basically uh, all of the a lot of the Huguenot leadership had come to Paris for a wedding that they mention in this between the between Henry of Navarre, who was Protestant and his wife, who was Catholic. And so you had all this Huguenot leadership in Paris at the time. And when the massacre happened, it basically wiped out the Huguenot leadership and they diminished as a movement after that. A lot of their followers reconverted to Catholicism and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, what's of interest to me here is how the writers and the show in general handles this issue, because England is a historically Protestant country. There have been historic tensions between Catholics and Protestants in England. In fact, today, you still can't be a monarch of England if you're Catholic. Um, and if, if a monarch marries a Catholic, they lose, you know, uh, they lose their position in the line of succession. Or if a, if a, a would-be monarch marries a Catholic, they lose their position in the line of succession. And so I was very interested to see how are they going to, this involves a massacre of Catholics killing Protestants. How are they going to handle it? Is this going to be badly handled like propaganda for Protestantism? Or is it going to be even handed? And, and how do you even do that in a situation? Now, what would be good is if they had done, I don't mind them doing a story like this, but I want to see balance. And one way they could balance it would be by also focusing on a, on a historical instance where Protestants massacred Catholics because that happened too. And so you can, you, neither side has a monopoly on bloodshed. And so you could balance it that way. They didn't end up doing that. What they tried to do instead was balance it within this episode, within this story. It's hard to do that because the the Catholics are the are the ultimate aggressors in this, but um, they they go out of their way to try to paint both sides as having their problems. So there are good Catholics in this, and there are bad Catholics, and there are good Protestants, and there are bad Protestants, and that's and they also try to just be very matter of fact about it. They don't try to 
unlike modern who they're not trying to lecture us you know Mm. um and they're not they they, you know they have a moral assessment of the massacre at the end through the voice of Stephen and the doctor where Stephen is outraged that this has happened and the doctor is yes but i can't change history and this is a real tragedy and so they they have a moral assessment of it but they're not lecturing the audience the way modern who does and i appreciate that um but there's lots of little things in this where they start setting us up as early as episode one for the protestants are not all good uh a lot of episode one is set in a tavern and they uh, th- um w- one of the protestants uh comments on bordeaux wine which of course is something france is famous for as being a thin catholic brew so he's he's dismissing it because it's catholic it and was in late uh-huh. uh, i'm sorry uh, uh bordeaux was often brewed by uh catholic religious orders right to be used for altar wine too and i think that might have been uh, an aspect of it yeah there's there's a, a number of verbal jabs um at catholics that protestants are making uh at one point uh gaston who's protestant um has been insulting to a guard who's catholic and he dismisses it as oh it was just a chance to bait a catholic you know so they're actively baiting catholics you know trying Mm -hmm. to provoke them um and they show uh, they have another uh protestant nicholas say many of our followers are just as bad as the catholics they have um they have i believe it's gaston later on tells nicholas who so we get the character anne chaplet who it wasn't clear to me if she's protestant or catholic i mean she's She's, you know well i know but i've read that but she also worked in the abbot's house and so that caused some confusion for me yeah. but um th- the um but she's been trying to warn about an oncoming ma- about the oncoming massacre that she's got advanced word of something like this is going to happen her data isn't clear but she knows something's up and um nicholas takes her seriously but gaston who it has been the most anti-catholic of the of the huguenots that we meet um he he's he says to nicholas at one point in reference to anne and how nicholas has been listening to anne he says you're too kind to these nothings so mm-hmm. gaston is a noble man and he doesn't care at all about anne and her situation because right. she's she's working class he doesn't care at all about her and even later, after the colony was uh, the attempted assassination, there's a mob of Huguenots who, you know, mm-hmm. they they try to attack Stephen because they think he was responsible or involved, and they 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 want to go attack Catholics and and massacre mm-hmm. them for. So you're right. I mean, so that it does it is kind of fair in showing, mm-hmm. you know, the, the these war, the French wars of religion. Uh, you know, for folks who don't know, and I wasn't super aware, you know, they went from 1562 about to around 1580. There was a long, or 1590 almost, I think, a uh, long period of time that these things were going on. And Anne references a massacre um, in her hometown, Vassy, mm-hmm. which is a, 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 was, was a precursor to this one, um, which was a really bad one. Uh, I remember reading about that one. But this, uh, apparently, according to Wikipedia, the Bartholomew's Day Massacre expanded out of, outside of Paris, and they said mm-hmm. up to 30,000 Huguenots were, were killed in this, uh, yeah. which is uh, terrible, awful. There's also another thing when the Protestant mob is like an order at one point is given to clear the street. And someone, I think it's Nicholas, says to drive Catholics from their homes will only make them hate us more. And so that was another point of, you know, attempted balance and i think they did a good job you know given that catholics are the ultimate aggressors in this i think they i think they did a good job balancing it they also showed catholics doing uh, good things the king is uh even though he's catholic he's he's got a his, uh, he you know the admiral's his buddy you know and and he uh he's he's trying to be you know, considerate and has worked out a basically a treat an internal treaty 
between Protestants and Catholics. So he, and it's pointed out, this is a generous agreement with the Protestants. And, um, and also there's a really nice bit where the, um, Stephen has gone to the abbot's house to talk to the abbot and he, uh, he, he wants to alert him. He thinks he's going to talk to the doctor and he wants to alert him to the assassination plot on the sea beggar on the admiral and he when he gets to the abbot's house the abbot is, can't be disturbed because he's say in his office and at first Stephen doesn't know what that means but he's the the abbot is basically doing PlayStation portable <laughs> and um and, but he says I'm 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 here it's urgent it's about a dying man and the, the priestly assistant of the abbot says, oh, well, if it's a matter of just uh, of administering the last rites, I'll come right now. And given his, it's, it's not a man who's dying right now, it's about an assassination plot, but he doesn't want to say that. But I just liked how they showed the priestly assistant as being, oh, I'll help a dying man right now. I'm, uh, let's mm -hmm. go, you know. Yep. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the, 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 characters who are not at forefront necessarily but they're there uh, you know so we have king charles who's the mm -hmm. king but his mother is oh, Catherine yeah. de medici or medici yeah. uh, uh, who's an italian from the florentine medici family the very famous uh, family and she was a huge figure in history the eight, mm -hmm. like she was queen she was married they to got the king a huge of France. actress playing her too uh who, who do they get playing her? i didn't recognize the Oh, I don't remember the name, but she's just physically imposing, and <laughs> oh, okay. and and she she doesn't even. I have in my notes because when she's in, when she first appears on camera, I mean, we hear about the Queen Mother, but when we see her, she's in this meeting with the King and his officials and so forth. She doesn't have, and they're all talking about her, and she's sitting right there and just observing, and she doesn't say a thing. In that, that was first in that first scene. She is a that shows you how much power she has that they're all yep. talking about her in her presence and she's just sitting there watching them it was surprising to me because when you, with audio i don't know she's there until the very end when she begins to leave i'm like well, they were saying these things in front of her but she is the power in mm -hmm. france she's, yeah you know charles is kind of weak and under her thumb and in fact she not only was she queen but once her husband died she three successive sons were kings of france one after the other mm -hmm. uh charles being i think the middle one and the marriage prince henri was marrying his sister charles's sister so her daughter marguerite uh, so that was what this the arrangement had been and so she was going to um uh, the, the kind of undermine this deal that she already made she was so catherine de medici was known just as sort of um the spy master she was the this political mastermind at least you know historically some theorize that she was this political mastermind in Fr in france and internationally even really running things uh, running the show and i understand for a children's show like this it's not historical scholarship i would be curious to know what modern historians have concluded about her but yeah here I here she's this powerful mostly not entirely silent you know power behind the throne I've read a little about her uh, just in, in passing and other things. And yeah, the, it kind of comes across that she's this powerful woman of, you know, uh, of the, of the, this period of time, this late middle ages or early Renaissance area. I, I, I don't know exactly how you would describe it, but um. this is, well, it's sort of the early modern period, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 1572. Yeah, you're right. Um, so, and we also have Marshal Tavan, the, who is the Catholic in the, count, the King's Council. He was the head of the army. You have Admiral de Coligny, the Protestant head of the Navy. And there was this whole thing with some with the Spanish and the Dutch and going to war, which I didn't get. I don't really know enough. I know a little about the history of the time, but I didn't understand what was going on there. So I'm not sure it's important to the story, but just... It's not. It's not. Yeah. It's just the, there's a debate about whether or not France is going to ally with the Dutch against the Spanish. Right. And I guess, again, the Dutch were Protestant, the Spanish were Catholic. And so that yeah. is probably part of it as well. So the doctor, when they land here in Paris in, the, in this era, they, he wants to go visit this Charles Preslin, who was an apothecary. And a real uh, guy who really oh, did, he really did like discover germs. Oh, interesting. Because I tried to look him up and I couldn't find anything about him. And, and what I found was someone saying that maybe he was a, uh, 
a type of Louis Pasteur, uh, but Louis Pasteur is much later, like centuries later, um, who was one of the fathers of germ science. But I didn't mm. realize that Prism was. Well, was I thought he person. was. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I looked uh, at the wrong source. Uh, yeah. Oh, well. um, Maybe I did. Because I, I, yeah. I, I just re Googled him and I'm not finding. Let's try this. Yep. It looks like I'm mistaken. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, the, uh, but it was interesting how the doctor, like, you know, w wanted to find this guy. And there was a whole, there's kind of a confusing bit in the middle where someone says, oh, no, Preslin died years, tell Stephen, Preslin died years ago. Um, so it, it led to this impression that the, whoever the doctor was talking to. Or he was, was arrested years ago and is probably dead. Yeah, and so they think it, they, someone was tricking him, and there was a whole period throughout this where, where he had this that Stephen thought the doctor was you know was pretending to be the abbot, where you this, this misdirection for the audience. We mm -hmm. we would have thought uh, had I not known ahead of time, having read <laughs> the TARDIS wiki, we would have thought it, on first viewing that yeah, the doctor's really doing this thing where he's pretending to be the abbot, and so when the abbot is taken out and shot by his own people for failing for uh the in the assassination attempt that that would have been shocking to watch i, mm -hmm. I can imagine like wait a minute what's going on here yeah and steven like comes up to his to his corpse and you know he's hovering over william hartnell here and and lamenting his death and stuff and it looks oh you just killed doctor who really <laughs> because and, they do they do set it up they explain they don't clearly explain what william hartnell is doing in, uh, right. what the doctor is doing in this period um he's got uh, he, he meets with preslin but then and we see some of that meeting but then he it's not clear how that meeting ends and then all of a sudden we've got william hartnell showing up as the abbot and so and stephen who is normally a viewpoint character for us tells us he thinks the doctor's impersonating the abbot um and then he gets killed and then steven is devastated by this he goes back to the apothecary he and Anne have been holing up in the apothecary's former shop and he said he tells Anne the doctor is dead and then all of a sudden the doctor shows up and all the only explanation we get is i was unavoidably detained yeah it's weird that they don't at least throw a line that's, in. That's that's a right and flaw. They should have said, yeah. "I was unavoidably detained. I had to get um, I had to get Preslin out of Paris so he could restart his scientific work or something like that." Yeah, yeah. Um, another inch, and and when Stephen thinks the doctor is dead, he realizes he has to get the TARDIS key so he can get yeah. back in the TARDIS and escape. Presumably, so drive the TARDIS himself. Yeah, but he doesn't have a TARDIS key, so the doctor's not yet given those out to companions. Yep. Um, uh, one of the things that was interesting, too, is just how Stephen is gradually isolated throughout this. Mm -hmm. First, he befriends the Huguenots, but they begin to suspect him once he thinks, once he starts telling them that the abbot is, is his, his friend that he's traveling with, and they're thinking, you're friends with the abbot, he's our enemy. And so you have this gradual isolation as he's trying to save the sea beggar and then eventually realizing it's Admiral de Colony. Uh, and he's trying to warn them and they're not listening. And at least Gaston is not Nicholas still thinks Stephen may be on the up and up, but there's this isolation that he goes through, which is, I think a pretty good writing, writing in this is to mm -hmm. have him gradually kind of running around, trying to get someone to believe him, trying to stop this thing that really he, he doesn't have any personal stake in any of this. You know, mm -hmm. it's not his life on the line. He, he's a man out of time. And yet he still has this desire and need to, to help these people to prevent something. And it speaks well to Stephen's character as we see it here. Yeah. And they assume the Huguenots. So what initially gets Stephen in good with the Huguenots is that he, because he doesn't know anything about this Protestant Catholic conflict and he's from the future. He knows less about it than we do. Mm -hmm. Um uh, is that he's English. <clears throat> and so it's, they, they pick up on the fact he's English. So I guess he's from the England of the 24th or 25th <laughs> century or whatever. Uh, and the accent hasn't changed so much that as it would in real life, they can still tell he's English and they just assume he's Protestant like they are. 
that's actually a dangerous assumption because in the 1500s, after uh, Protestantism was imposed on the British populace, um, there were a lot of people who were still Catholic, and some of them were crypto Catholics. Um, like there's speculation William Shakespeare was a crypto Catholic um, based on things that are in his plays. There also, though, were what were known as recusants who were Catholics that had the, 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 the financial and political resources to stand their ground and resist the imposition of Protestantism. And they maintained estates where everybody stayed Catholic. You know, uh, they were able to thread this delicate political situation. And then there are expatriate Catholics from England, because what happened with a lot of folks is they, they wouldn't abandon their faith, but they didn't have the resources to be a recusant. And so they fled the country. And one of the places they went was France. That's, in fact, how we got the um, the famous Catholic Douay Reims Bible, which is the Catholic equivalent of the King James Version, but actually came out before the King James Version. There was a there was uh, there were groups of Catholics in Douay, France, and in Reims, France, and they translated the Old and the New Testaments and stuck them together, and it became known as the Douay Reims Version. Right. So, right. Pre, so these these Huguenots, even though they they gloss over it, it's actually a bad assumption that Stephen is a Protestant just because he's from England. He could very well be an expatriate Catholic who fled over here. That's right. Uh, there is at one point Catherine uh, de Medici, the, the the Queen Mother. Uh, she's she's told um, when she's trying to you know talk about the the when she's planning the massacre. Mm -hmm. So yeah, at first it's only supposed to be the massacre of you know I think Tavan is the is the one who says you know it's supposed to be the leadership. Yeah. He's of, got a list of who yeah, he wants of the to kill. Yeah, yeah, and she says no, no, we're gonna we're gonna do them all. And uh, and he's objects. So the innocent. What about the innocent? And she says, innocent heresy can have no innocence. France will breathe a pure air after tomorrow. Uh, and it's it's so chilling to hear someone mm -hmm. kind of talk about you know a faith perspective like that, where mm -hmm. you know you're trying to like there there is no innocence. We must murder people who have different beliefs. It's it's so feels so contrary to what we should. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, believe and do uh, the way even today. They yeah, the way they looked at it, though, and, you know, you can find discussions of this, for example, in St. Thomas Aquinas about, you know, should we execute heretics, which is essentially what this is. This is mm -hmm. they're going to they don't do it through a judicial process, which if you're going to do it, you should do it through a judicial process rather than mob violence. Um, but it, you know, the idea that they had was if someone's preaching heresy, people are responsible for embracing it and they will go to hell. And so you must check heresy. Uh, Aquinas says, if we kill a killer to stop him from killing other people who, and he only causes physical death, how much more should we kill a heretic? to stop him from spreading spiritual death. So the argument was that this will protect the community. It wasn't it's simply about, um, you know, purity and we'll breathe pure air once we get rid of this scum. No, the idea was we're going to protect people's souls, which are more important than their bodies. As Jesus himself says, you know, you could lose a body part. It's better to lose a body part and enter into life than to end up in hell. And and people, based on the understanding they had of that in the Middle Ages, on both sides, both Protestant and Catholic, they would look at the others as heretical and therefore as a danger to people's eternal destinies. And that's what drove both sides to use violence against each other as a means of trying to protect the community as they understood it. Mm. And, you know, and not to discount also the intertwining of political power with religion. Yep. You know, the Catholic king, his power comes partly from the divine right to rule as a Catholic king. And so heresy was a threat to his authority in that sense. And the same thing was true of Protestant magistrates yes. as well. Yeah. You saw that often in Germany, for instance, where mm -hmm. you had Protestant kings often or in England with uh, uh, Henry and that sort of thing. 
or so yeah yeah let's talk about the this kind of rem- i found the ending you know after you know the escape mm-hmm. from paris and everything that happens after that remarkable it's kind of interesting yeah. I wanted to talk about the how they handle the massacre itself because this is a kid's okay. show, so they cannot show us footage of people stabbing each other with swords and stuff. Sure. In fact, British television is skittish about that even today. There's a scene in Babylon 5 where um, Ambassador Jakar of the Narn is in an elevator with Vir Kodo of the Centauri and their two peoples are at war. And Veer is very, Veer is a good guy and he is, he's expressing his regret to Jakar about what his people are doing to Jakar's people. And he basically apologizes, even though he has no official stand in, but he basically apologizes. Jakar is so irate at this point, he's not having the apology and he takes out his ceremonial dagger cuts his palm and let and clenches his fists and let his fist and lets blood drip out and just says dead 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 apologize to them and but british television won't let uh, won't let us see jacquard cutting his palm they there's more squeamish about showing blood than americans are or at least were in the 1990s and so they would cut the moment where jacquard cuts his palm and just show us the before and after. So there's no way in 1966 that British children's television is going to show us a massacre. And so Mm -hmm. what they do is they show us a montage of images from artwork of the massacre and its aftermath. And as they show us this montage of artistic images, they uh, play a soundtrack that has the sound of people screaming and the sound of um, uh, drums and the sound of fire burning, you know, crackling. And and it's a very effective montage. And so this happens after Stephen and the Doctor have taken off. We then get this montage sequence to show us this is what's happening in Paris after they leave. And then we cut to the TARDIS where the Doctor reveals to Stephen what's actually happening back in where they've just left. Right. He tells them like even, you know, the Admiral and Nicholas both die, which they did historically die uh, in the massacre. And Stephen's enraged. He like, he just, Mm -hmm. the doctor, like, why couldn't you have stopped it or done anything? Why did you send, he thinks he sent Anne to die, you know, because Mm -hmm. the, the gates of the, of the city had been locked. Nobody's getting out. And, and as a Huguenot, where can she go? If she goes home to her aunt's house, they know they presumably the Catholics know that Anne's family are Huguenots and they'll they'll massacre them there, he thinks. And so uh he's just enraged by the doctor's disregard for human life. And the doctor says, I can't change history. You know, this yeah. is one of those moments where we early on where the doctor's explaining, I can't change history. Yeah, he says in particular that all and I thought I really like this line. He says all of us are too small to understand history's final pattern. And I think mm-hmm. that's true. Um, God sees history's final pattern and how it all works out in the end. But all of us are too small to do that. And so we have to kind of just do our best in the situation. Now, what the doctor could have done, because I agree with Stephen, it is cold for him to see to send Anne Chaplet back to her aunt's house, because which is where he sends her. Um, because he, unlike the Admiral and Nicholas, the doctor doesn't know her fate. So it's not, and she's not an essential political player in this period. She's just a servant. And so, um, so she could become a companion. Mm -hmm. He could take her out. And in fact, they considered, uh, making Anne Chaplet a companion of the doctor. Cause right now it's just Steven. And they ended up not doing that because they were afraid of a concern like Katrina, uh, or Katarina, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. who had been the companion, a temporary companion that they didn't plan on keeping because she was from the past and was ignorant of many of the concepts that she'd be introducing. They later proved that's not a concern in the second doctor's time because they introduced Jamie. Yep. And Jamie was from the past and he just rolled with anything that happened. It was fine. 
Um, so they were unnecessarily cautious about introducing a companion from the past in this case, but the doctor could have saved Anne. There's also a problem with the, with the solution they give at the end of Dodo's grandfather. It was a Frenchman named Chaplet and her name is Chaplet. And that's somehow evidence that Anne survived. Well, yeah, names are passed down by the male line, not the female name. So mm-hmm. if Anne Chaplet had gotten married to anybody and had descendants, unless she married a man named Chaplet, those descendants wouldn't be named Chaplet. That's a very good point. <laughs> <laughs> they were not quite that forward thinking back then where the woman could keep her name. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. And certainly true. not for descendants of, of a woman. Mm-hmm. And Stephen, then, you know, like he, like, I'm out of here. Like, wherever yeah. we land, I'm done. Yeah. He says, if your researchers have so little regard for human life, then I want no part of it. Just remarkable. I mean, he's been traveling with the doctor for a little bit, not very long. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, you know, they land in the 1960s. So basically, 1960s England. Six. And, yeah. Yeah. And uh, opens the door and he's gone. And the, and you, as you mentioned, the doctor's like, uh, muses over the loss of companions and how none of them really understood even even yeah. susan his granddaughter and i didn't buy that i think susan understood um but he he there's this really touching moment where he sits down in a chair after Stephen storms out and he says they're all gone none of them could understand not even my little susan which i don't think is true and then he mentions vicky barbara Chatterton, Chesterton, <laughs> and I have to wonder if that was deliberate. And now, and now, Stephen, and then he says, "Perhaps I should go home, back to my own planet, but I can't." Which is that, the which is kind of a first. I, I don't I don't think we've had it said before that he can't go back. Um, that I it, I mean it. He, they may have mentioned that earlier in the first Doctor's tenure, but I don't remember it. So this may mm. be the first indication that he left in a way that burned bridges or something. And he, there would be a price to him going back. Yeah. Interesting. The, the, the they set up the mystery there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have Dodo running in. So this is one of those times when back when police boxes were still a thing in England. Yeah. So Dodo was expected to be a police box with a police, a phone to the police department inside. And what I love about Dodo now, she unfortunately does not stay long as a companion, but I, and, and I, a lot of people think that she isn't very bright and she isn't very good as a companion. I totally disagree with that. I, I really like Dodo. I think she was a great companion. Mm. Um, but what I love is, and I think part of what was against her was her name because she's, she's meant to be, her real name, is, she says, is Dorothea. Uh, chaplet but she goes by dodo chaplet and the problem is dodo birds have a reputation for being stupid and and i think that conveyed an impression about the character dodo chaplet that was not the case she was meant to be a modern 60s young person and i think she was and she's fine as far as i'm concerned i like her as a character um but what i love is when she barges into the TARDIS and wants to know where the phone is, she completely does not notice that it's larger on the inside (laughs) than the outside. She just, where's the phone? And we don't get any of the whoa reaction we get from most people. So she's got, (laughs) as far as I'm concerned, she's got one of the best TARDIS entrances ever. Isn't Ace also a Dorothea? Uh, Dorothy. Not Dorothy. Dorothea. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I thought it, I would have thought of that if the that was the case. Um, interesting. So, uh, yeah, the yeah the idea though that she's a descendant of Anne Chaplet, maybe descendant of Anne Chaplet's brother. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't tell us Anne survived. No, it does not. Any other notes on this one, Jimmy? Well, I like when Stephen runs back in, it's to warn the doctor that a couple of policemen are coming. So mm. he's he even though he was outraged, he 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 runs back in and and tells the doctor he needs to take off. And then the doctor does take off and Stephen is horrified. 
And he and the doctor's like, you just told me to take off. You're awfully inconsistent. <laughs> um, but uh, and he, of course, he wanted him to take off because two policemen were about to try to enter the TARDIS. Um, and that would just complicate matters further. But I, I, I think if if I and it all happens really fast, but I think what Stephen may have been outraged by is the doctor taken off possibly with him on board. He mm-hmm. may have meant, just meant to duck in and warn the doctor and then he was going to duck out again. And the doctor has now taken him and he's even he's definitely outraged about the doctor taking off with Dodo because the um, the uh, TARDIS is not under the doctor's control in this era of the show. And he tells Dodo, you may you you may never get back again. And Dodo's like, so what? And he's like, what about your parents? And so, I don't have any parents. I've always wanted a different life. This is my chance. And all I've got is an <laughs> aunt. And she's not going to miss me at all. So, um, so, so Dodo is up for the adventure, which is more about what I like about Dodo. Yeah. Um, there also is now you wouldn't have seen this in the audio version. Cause I assume they didn't include Lincoln narration, but in the video version that would cover this uh, in the video version, as the TARDIS dematerializes, we get an external view and we see a woman stand in or walking by as the TARDIS dematerializes. What that was meant to be in the original planning for this show was a cameo by Ian and Barbara. They were Mm. both going to walk by and see the TARDIS dematerializing. (laughs) And that would have been great if they had managed to do that. Um, But, uh, but it didn't work out. The doctor does mention, by the way, that, uh, Dodo looks a lot like Susan, which she does. Uh, up to a point, although she's shorter and a little stockier than Susan. Yeah. Dark hair, young woman. Yeah. I just love how how in his reminiscences, I mean, he mentions not even my little Susan, then Vicky and Barbara and Chatterton and <laughs> Chesterton. <laughs> and I love how I don't know if that was deliberate or not, but it was awesome either way. where he Because he had a habit of mispronouncing Chesterton's name. Yeah. He, yeah, he. I didn't know whether it was a typical Hartnell flub or whether he was also commenting on the amount of Chesterton's the way he, he talked. What? Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, all right. So that oh, is the. I, I also wanted to notice Dodo is kind of timey wimey for this era of the show. Mm, you know, um, they, they don't normally incorporate this level of cross time thinking. Uh, where, you know, she's an apparent descendant of Anne Chaplet and, and the, that's, that's a little timey wimey for this era of the show. Mm-hmm. That's true. Uh, and that is the massacre. Uh, so we'll conclude our discussion of that and move on to our feedback. Uh, first feedback comes from an older episode, uh, episode 186. Where we discussed the fifth doctor story, earth shark shock, not earth shark. That would be an interesting one. Earth shock. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is uh, from 2020, the, that episode. Anyway, Boojification wrote on YouTube, I love emotionless Cybermen so much more. They're unique and way more creepy. Emotions don't mean agency. And it's way interesting for me to see an emotionless agency, even if it's based on flawed assumptions, than another emotional villain. Which is mm-hmm. interesting. Uh, also, in Shinjas' position, you love emotionless Cybermen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the next one... Um, so this was a comment technically on episode 383, the belly, of the beast, which was a missy big finish story. Mm. But, uh, well, let me read the first comment. <laughs> It'll explain. So Mark Gillies on YouTube writes, I'm really confused with this one. I thought it was supposed to be a missy story. So what he's referring to is the fact that I messed up and I used the wrong video file for the YouTube version of, of that episode. Uh, and so that was, I sort of released the next episode, 384, The Creed of the Cromon, which was an eighth Doctor Big Finish story, a week early. So that video is was on YouTube a week early. I then so in the midst of all this, I just changed the the title and, and then uploaded uh the 383 uh, mm-hmm. a few days late. So the, the belly of the beast. All wibbly wobbly timey wimey missy caused us problems. Exactly. And frankly, as you're hearing this, it doesn't matter since this is weeks later and everything is on on youtube in the right place and if you listen to the audio you didn't even notice anything 
but that means that when truly awesome New Mexico Catholic wrote uh, his comment on the episode, he was really referring to Creed the Cromon, and he said, uh, good reference, Jimmy. Earthworm Jim was and is awesome. Next SQPN show, The Secrets of Earthworm Jim. <laughs> that would be interesting. This, we'll do that yep. after The Secrets of Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for your feedback really appreciate it and now we'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of doctor who including javier p jude s austin t christopher k and ira r their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of doctor who and all the shows at starquest and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give this StarQuest show is also brought to you by Exodus 90 and the Exodus 90 app, a daily companion to help you grow closer to God and to become the man you want to be. This summer, join the Enthronement to the Sacred Heart, the Exodus 90 Summer Book Club, and St. Michael's Lent, beginning August 15th and leading up to the Feast of St. Michael the Archangel on September 29th. Go to exodus90.com sqpn for a 14-day free trial to the Exodus 90 app and to learn more about St. Michael's Lent. That's exodus90.com slash sqpn to join us for St. Michael's Lent starting August 15th. And we'd also like to thank Azamin Yannick who edited this episode. So that's it from us. What did you think of the massacre? Let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page Send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. And you can watch The Secrets of Doctor Who, hopefully the correct version, on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash starquestmedia. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing an 11th Doctor, big finish story, The Top of the Tree. Until then, Jimmy Yakin, thank you for joining me and sharing The Secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you et bonjour. <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, you are an extraordinary man, Tavan. You see shadows where there is no sun. <laughs> <laughs>